I'm so pleased to welcome Matt, Matthew Desmond this evening to discuss his important new book, Evicted, which is just out and already generating a much needed conversation about poverty in America and the role that eviction plays in creating a downward spiral for those already on the economic edge, the devastating effects of which often hit women and children the hardest. To research this book, Desmond immersed himself in the poorest communities in Milwaukee, and he profiles his characters with such vividness and depth that the book at times reads like a novel. The reviews have all been outstanding and have drawn comparisons to Kate Boo's Behind the Beautiful Forevers, another powerful work of immersion reporting about poverty. The New York Times has called this an extensively researched, vividly realized, and above all, unignorable book, adding that after evicted, it will no longer be possible to have a serious discussion about poverty without having a serious discussion about housing. Desmond is the winner of a 2015 MacArthur Genius Grant. He's also the author of several other books, including On the Fire Line, in which he chronicled the experiences of a fire crew in northern Arizona. He's currently the John L. Loeb Associate Professor of Social Sciences at Harvard, and he's the co-director of the Justice and Poverty Project. Please help me welcome Matthew Desmond. Oh, so you, so now you get the nice yes. chair. That's how it works. You get the nice, you, you yeah, get the nice chair. Oh man! Oh, it's such an honor to be here in this bookstore, which is so special to the city and so special to people that love books. Um, it's really an honor to be here. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Uh, uh, it's so good to see some people I love in the audience and um, and friends. I uh, I really appreciate you guys taking times out of your super busy schedule to hear me out on this one. There are two chairs right here. There are two chairs. Two chairs exist. They're empty. They're for, they're for you. They're for you too, I believe. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's just do it. It's good. Um, we're already making difference. We're already solving, we're solving problems. So, so this book is based on in-depth field work that I started in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, uh, in 2008, and um, when I was living in two very poor neighborhoods in, uh, in that city. And um, I spent, was spending time with people getting evicted from their homes and their landlords doing the evicting. I started by moving into a very poor trailer park on the far south side of the city. I rented a trailer there and I lived there for about five months. And then I lived in the rooming house in the inner city, the traditionally African-American poor neighborhood of Milwaukee. And I rented a room and I lived there for about nine, ten months. And from those two neighborhoods kind of embedded myself in the lives of folks facing uh, uh, extremely hard situations. I went to eviction court with people, followed them to shelters and abandoned houses, uh, went to funerals with them at one time of birth, AA meetings, counseling sessions, church, and just generally try to sink myself as deeply as I could into their everyday lives. But I knew if I was going to really understand this thing, this connection between housing and poverty, I also had to get the landlord's perspective. So I spent time with landlords doing the evicting too. I went to eviction court with them as well, watched them buy property, sell property, deliver groceries to tenants, evict tenants, um, and collect rents. Now, when this was happening, I was kind of coming up against questions like, how often does eviction happen? Who does it happen to? What are the long-term consequences of this problem? So I went looking for studies that would help me answer those questions and found basically nothing. No real good data that would allow me to get my handle on that. So I decided to get that data myself. Uh, we ended up surveying over a thousand renters in the city of Milwaukee. I analyzed hundreds of thousands of eviction records, millions of 911 calls, and put that information in concert with what I was seeing on the ground uh, to kind of figure out what's going on at the very bottom uh, uh, today. And I think all those methods inform my perspective and each kept the other honest. This book, Evicted, follows eight families uh, swept up in the process of eviction. Some of them are white, some of them are black, some of them have children, some of them don't. Uh, we meet Lorraine, who is my neighbor at the trailer park, who was a grandmother. She had to decide between paying her rent and paying the gas bill so she could take a hot shower. We meet Lamar, who's this gregarious uh, role model in the neighborhood. He's a disabled single dad, and he tries to work off the rent. 
uh, with his landlord. We meet Vanetta, who was a mom of three kids who had never had a criminal record, had a working job, but when her hours were cut, uh, was desperate to keep her family uh, housed and so participated in a botched armed robbery to hopefully get some money to pay the landlord. I can't tell you about all these stories today, but I'm going to tell you about uh, one. I'm going to tell you uh, Arlene's story. So it had been a difficult year ever since uh, that snowball. Arlene's 14-year-old son, Jory, and his cousin had been cutting up, tossing snowballs at passing cars. And Jory packed this tight one and threw it and smacked this car, and it jerked to a stop. And this man jumped out. And Jory and his cousin ran inside and locked the door. And the man came up to it and kicked that door and broke the door down. And thankfully, he left before anything else happened. But when Arlene's landlord found out about that, uh, she evicted Arlene and her two boys for damaging property. And Arlene had cussed Jory because she couldn't cuss the landlord. So Arlene took her two sons. Uh, Jory, like I said, was 14. Jafaris, her youngest son, was six. Took them to the Salvation Army Homeless Shelter, which everyone just called the Lodge. So you can tell your kids, I'm staying at the Lodge tonight like it's a hotel. And from there, she started looking for another house. She found one on 19th Street. Uh, there often was no water, and Jory had to bucket out what was in the toilet. It was quiet, Arlene remembered, and 525 for a whole house, it was my favorite place. We know from this story, and we know from the survey day that we did, that families that get evicted relocate to substandard housing, which has a really bad effect on kids' health. Now, the city eventually found Arlene's favorite place unfit for human habitation, and hard-headed men removed her and her boys, and they boarded up the windows, and the doors, and she again was on the hunt for another place to live. She told Jory, we take whatever we can get. And that's what neighborhood and housing selection looks like for people like Arlene, just taking whatever you can get. And what Arlene could get was a drab apartment complex on Atkinson Avenue. So she moved in, but she soon learned it was a haven for drug dealers, and she was terrified for her boys, especially for Jory, who had this beautiful smile and was goofy and slack-shouldered and would talk to anyone hungry to prove himself, just like he did with that snowball. So why she moved was really important for understanding why she ended up in such a tough neighborhood. We tested that with statistical data, too, and we found that evicted families moved from poor neighborhoods to even poorer ones, from dangerous neighborhoods to even more dangerous ones. Arlene moved out as fast as she could when she found a two-bedroom duplex on 13th Street. There was a fist-sized hole in the window, uh, the door had to be locked with this ugly wooden plank. The carpet was filthy and ground into the floor. Uh, but she put on a good face. She stuffed a piece of cloth into that hole in the window and she hung ivy curtains. The rent for that uh, two-bedroom unit in one of the worst neighborhoods in the fourth poorest city in America uh, was $550, which would take 88% of Arlene's welfare check. Just 88% at the beginning of every month, gone. And Arlene is not alone in spending the majority of what she has on housing. We have reached a point in this country where most low-income renters are paying most of what they have on housing costs. And one in four poor renting families are spending at least 70% of their income to pay rent and keep the lights on. Under these conditions, eviction is not always the result of personal irresponsibility, but inevitability. In the 2000s, housing costs soared while incomes at the bottom were stagnant. And I think many of us who don't live in trailer parks or in the inner city still think that the typical low-income family benefits from public housing or some other side kind of housing assistance. But the opposite of tr is true. Only about one in four households that qualify for any kind of housing assistance in this country receive it. One in four. That arrangement would be unthinkable with other social services that meet basic needs. Like imagine if we turned away three out of four families that applied for food stamps. I'm sorry, you're going to have to go hungry. But that's exactly how we treat housing in this country. And in this city, our nation's capital, the waiting list for public housing is not counted in years. It's counted in decades. So if you're a single parent and you apply for public housing today, you might be a grandparent by the time your application comes up. Most poor renting families are getting nothing from the government and they're living unassisted in the private rental market. So on 13th Street, Arlene found like uh, uh, paint and brushes and rollers in the basement and she painted the walls. She put on a fresh coat. But not long after she moved in, um, her sister died. 
was in her sister in a physical sense, a biological sense, but in the spiritual sense, they're close friends. And Arlene decided to contribute something to the funeral. She didn't have the money, but no one else did either. And she would have felt ashamed of herself if she didn't pitch in. The next month, she missed an appointment with her welfare caseworker because the letter announcing that appointment was mailed to 19th Street, or maybe it was Atkinson Avenue. And her caseworker typed something into the computer, and her $628 a month welfare check was cut, sliced, sanctioned. And two months behind, uh, Arlene got the pink papers, the eviction summons and complaint. Milwaukee is a city of about 105,000 renter households. And in that city, landlords evict roughly 16,000 people every year. That's about 40 people a day evicted in the city of Milwaukee. Now these numbers screen, these numbers up on the screen, they're only formal court-ordered evictions, okay? These are legal records. These are evictions that go through the court. But there are other ways, cheaper and quicker ways, for a landlord to displace a family. So I've met a landlord that will pay you $200 and let you use his van if you're out by Sunday. I met a landlord that'll just take your door off. We worked really hard in the survey to capture all those things, to capture those informal evictions that don't go through the court, the formal evictions that do, landlord foreclosures, and building condemnations, what happened to Arlene's favorite place. And when you add up all of those, you learn that every two years, one in eight renters in the city of Milwaukee is evicted. It's an incredibly high number. And the number is similar in Kansas City and Cleveland and Chicago and other cities that I've looked at. According to the most recent data from the American Housing Survey, renters in over 2.8 million households in the United States thought that they would be evicted soon. Eviction affects the young and the old, the sick and the able-bodied, but the face of this country's eviction epidemic belongs to mothers and children. Walk into any urban housing court in America almost, and you'll see row after row of moms and kids. And low-income African-American moms like Arlene are evicted at startling high, startlingly high rates. Among Milwaukee renters, one in five black women report being evicted sometime in their life. One in five. The equivalent for white women renters is one in 15. It's a startling number in the way that I've come to think about it, that if we have this thing, this incarceration, if incarceration has become this typical, critical experience in the lives of low-income African-American men, eviction is the feminine equivalent. Eviction is reshaping the lives of low-income African-American women. But this problem is widespread as, too, as well. It affects white folks, it affects immigrant communities, and it's, it's something that's going on all over the country. One in five of all renters, regardless of their income, report paying at least 50% of their income on housing costs. In eviction court, uh, the court commissioner gave Arlene two extra days to stay in her home for each of her two dependent kids. Those days came and they went. And Arlene had to be out, uh, on an early day in January. Um, Milwaukee's cold, and this day was cold. The weathermen had been working themselves up. They said it was gonna be the coldest day in a decade. They said that temperature could bottom out at 40 below with the windshield. But if Arlene waited any longer, the landlord could call the sheriff who had arrived with uh, a sidearm and a team of movers and pile all her things on the sidewalk. Her meat cuts in the freezer, her copy of Don't Be Afraid to Discipline, the silk plants, Jafaris' asthma machine. So she took her boys and she left to a homeless shelter and once again began searching for housing. And she called on or applied for 20 apartments, and then 40, and then 60, and then 80. I counted. She had been accepted to none. And even in the inner city, most were out of reach. And the landlords of the places she could afford if she threw almost everything she had at rent weren't calling back either. And part of the reason had to do with her eviction record. So Milwaukee, your eviction records is published online for free for anyone to see. And many landlords that I met just reject anyone with a recent eviction record. That's why families are pushed into worse neighborhoods and into worse housing. Now finally, Mr. 90, number 90, said yes, the 90th landlord that Arlene approached. He had a one bedroom apartment for 525. She didn't much consider the neighborhood or the condition of the place. A house is a house, she told Jory. 
So two months after her eviction court hearing, she moved into her new place. And they brought their things up. She liked it. You know, all the cupboards had handles. All the lights had fixtures. Um, it was nice. And she brought her things up, and she unpacked them. And once everything was inside, she sat down on the floor, and she found, like, a garbage bag that had, like, towels or clothes in it. And she leaned against it. And Jory came and sat down next to her and pitched his head on his mom's shoulder. And Jafaris came and laid his head on her lap. And they just stayed like that for a long time. Arlene uh, got her stuff out of storage. She hung pictures on the wall. She liked things neat, so she had a little sign put up over the sink that said, uh, if you don't clean up after yourself, we're going to have problems. <laughs> but soon Jory started acting out in school. It's hard to be 14. It's hard to be 14 and experience long stretches of homelessness. Between seventh and eighth grade, Jory had been to five different schools. One day, a teacher snapped at him, and uh, he kicked her in the shin and uh, ran home. And instead of calling the principal, uh, she called the police. And when they followed Jory home, and the landlord found out about that, he told Arlene she had to go. She, um, she told me after that, it's like I got a curse on me. I won't stop for nothing. Sometimes I find my body trembling or shaking. I'm tired, but I can't sleep. I'm fixing to have a nervous breakdown. My body is trying to shut down. Recently published a study that found that mothers who were evicted experience higher rates of depression two years after the event. And we know that between 2005 and 2010, years where rents in this country were going up and up, Suicides attributed to eviction and foreclosures doubled. Just my soul is messed up, Arlene told me. I wish my life were different. I wish that when I be an old lady, I can sit back and look at my kids and they be grown and they, you know, become something. And we'll all be together and be laughing. We'll be remembering stuff like this and be laughing at it. The home is the center of life. It's our refuge from work. It's our protection from the menace of the streets. We say at home, we can be ourselves. Everywhere else, we're someone else. At home, we take off our masks. In languages spoken all over the world, the word for home encompasses not just shelter, but warmth, safety, family, the womb. But eviction, which used to be rare in this country, which used to draw crowds, is coursing through the American city and erasing the home. And it is not just a condition of poverty, it's a cause of it. We cannot fix poverty in this country unless we fix housing. So what should we do about it? I think the way to answer that question requires us to address another, which is, do we believe that housing is a fundamental right? Do we believe that part of what it means to be an American is to have access to safe and decent housing? We've affirmed the right to a basic education, provision in old age, basic nutrition, because we've agreed as a society that those things are fundamental to human flourishing. And it's hard to argue that housing isn't fundamental to human flourishing. Without stable shelter, everything else falls apart. And I think the way we can deliver on this obligation is through a universal voucher program. We can take a program that we already have that's serving the lucky minority of low-income families and we can expand it so it meets the need of all families living below the poverty line. The idea is simple. If you got a voucher, you could take that voucher and instead of paying 88% of your income to rent, 70% of your income to rent, you pay 30% of your income to rent with the voucher covering the rest. You could live wherever you'd like as long as your housing isn't too expensive or too shoddy. It would change the face of poverty in this country. Evictions would plummet. They'd become rare again. Homelessness would drop. 
When families finally receive housing vouchers after years and years and years on the waiting list, they do one consistent thing with the freed up income. They go to the grocery store. They buy more food. Their children become stronger and less anemic and healthier. But a lot of kids today with names like Jory and Jafaris are not getting enough to eat because the rent eats first. That's wrong. A national affordable housing program could change that. It would be an anti-poverty effort, a human capital investment, a community improvement plan, and a public health initiative all rolled into one. I think this is one of many potential policy recommendations that can be thrown at this problem. Let others come. What works in Washington, D.C. might not work in Milwaukee or San Francisco or Dallas. One city has to build, another has to tear down. But whatever our way out of this mess, I think one thing is clear. This cold denial of basic needs, this endorsement of pointless suffering, this extreme degree of inequality, this isn't us. By no American value is just this justified. We can find no ethical teaching, no holy scripture to be summoned to defend what we've allowed our nation to become. Thanks, guys, for coming. Uh, before we go to the questions, I've just been asked to let you know that the there's a black car in the handicapped spot down in the lot that has its lights on. So, question. This is really, this is, is this turned on? Yes. Okay, this is really more a statement. In 2014, there were $180 billion of tax expenditures for deductions for people, like most of the people in this room, who have mortgages, who, de who deduct the interest, who deduct the real estate taxes, and who, when they sell their house, they get a break on the capital gains. In that, put it into vouchers. So you're right. So um, we already have a universal housing program in this country. It's just not for the poor. And, um, and I think that for many middle class Americans, uh, the mortgage income reduction is a, is a road to stability. It's something that they, they bargained for. It was part of the deal that they went in. But we need to at least be honest about this fact. We need to be honest that the majority of our tax dollars at least with respect to housing, are going to homes with six-figure incomes. And stop repeating the canard that this rich land can't afford to do more. If poverty persists in this country, it's not for lack of resources. We lack something else. As a native of Milwaukee, I'm curious as to your connection uh, to the city and why you chose this for your study. So I haven't read the book yet, so yeah. it may be explained, and I apologize. Yeah, yeah. I love Milwaukee. I, there's something about that city and a lot of other Rust Belt cities that make me feel at home. I think that the story of uh, urban America tends to be written on the margins. You know, we spend a lot of time focusing on uh, our biggest successes, New York, San Francisco, or cities that we consider maybe our biggest failures, like Detroit. I think if you want to write a story um, about an American experience and have a shot at representing what's going on in Cleveland and Kansas City and Indianapolis and Cincinnati, Milwaukee gives you a good shot at this. So this book is based in Milwaukee. It's a Milwaukee book, but it tells a very American story. Two questions. Um, one being, on, in the conversation about homelessness, um, landlords are often depicted as ill-intentioned, exploitative, unsympathetic. Can you humanize them a little bit for us? So you mentioned that you spent a lot of time talking to landlords as well. Are they also, are they just r rational human beings making rational decisions in a system? Or can we fairly characterize them as enemies in this fight? And then the second question is, um, what do you think ethnography brings to your policy recommendations that quantitative analysis doesn't? Thanks. Thank you. Um, so the book works really hard to complicate the relationship between landlords and tenants. I think that we let ourselves off the hook. We allow ourselves to have the lazier conversation. If we just say, oh, these tenants, they're just irresponsible, or 
oh, these landlords, they're greedy. The reality is it's a lot more complicated than that. Uh, Arlene's landlord, Sharina, when Arlene moved in, she noticed uh, the kids didn't have any food. She went to the grocery store and bought food uh, for Arlene. Uh, she, she's allowed tenants to, um, to slip on rent. You know, uh, how many of us would lose $500, $1,000 and just be okay with that? Landlords do take the hits directly. Um, Sharina's had a firebomb thrown her o- through her office window. She's had tenants stuff socks down the sink and turn the water on full blast and then move out. There's stuff that happens. Sharina also makes in a single month more than Arlene makes in a year. Um, it's a fact. When I uh, lived in the trailer park, I thought it was very important to understand how much my landlord was making. So I analyzed his own rent rolls. And I looked at vacancies, missing payments, his mortgage payment, his tax payment, his electricity bill, his water bill. I could go on and on and on. I'm just telling you all this so you believe me when I say that the landlord of the worst trailer park in a very poor city in the country, which is made up of 131 trailers, took over $470,000 in profit after expenses every year. That's, that's over 30 times what his tenants working full-time minimum wage took home, and over 50 times what his tenants on disability took home. Are, are we okay with that? You know, is that something we, we should tolerate? Um, I think that's something that I, we need to have a, a public conversation about. Now, your second question was about ethnography or in-depth reporting, which is a question about um, how to telling people stories or showing the human costs of social problems um, how is that connected to reform? And I think it's deeply connected to reform. I think getting out of the way of the story and allowing people like Arlene uh, to kind of come through and kind of document as rigorously as I can um, what she's going through, the terrible you know, decisions she's forced to make, the effect this has on her soul, as she put it, and her parenting, and how this is blunting her capacity and like diluting her talents and reducing this person who was born for better things. I think that's deeply connected to policy reform. And in housing specifically, we see this in generation after generation, going back to Jacob Rees, who changed the laws in New York City by showing us the degradation of tenements. And so I think that this book is very much in the spirit and tradition of of that kind of work. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk about why this is disproportionately affecting black women. So it's a big question, and I think that one thing that we're seeing here is the uh, ongoing prevalence of racial discrimination. And I can, uh, in the housing market, and uh, I can quote study after study after study, but let me just tell you uh, one story. Um, so I was with uh, t- uh, two African American women, um, uh, Crystal and Vanetta, and they were both homeless and looking for housing. And they looked on the near south side of Milwaukee, which is the traditional Latino neighborhoods. And they were in a place, and I was in the car watching Vanetta's kids. And um, from what the, the woman, uh, woman told me right afterwards is the landlord came in. He showed them the place. It was small, pretty shoddy. Uh, and there wasn't a tub. And Vanetta has three young kids. And anyone who has three young kids in the here knows, like, you got to have the tub. And so uh, she said, do you have another place with a tub? And the landlord says, yeah, I've got this other place, bigger, a little nicer. Rent is the same. And then he just stopped himself as if, like, um, remembering something and reached for his phone, had a fake conversation and said, you know, wouldn't you know it? It just went. So I wrote down his number. I'm a white guy. Uh, I, uh, I called him the next day, you know, uh, s- did the tour. I said, uh, I told him that I made the same as our, uh, Vanetta and Crystal made, told him I had three kids, said, do you have any place with like a tub? And he drove me to it uh, in a sob. This happens a lot, and it's why Arlene is getting, you know, looking at 20, 40, 60, 80 places. I think that's, that's a real thing. I think another thing we have to recognize is the role of kids, the role of kids. And when I started this work, I thought that kids would, like, shield people from eviction, but it actually exposes people to eviction. You see this in, in Arlene's story about the snowball and also about the, um, uh, the, the uh, incident with Jory at, at school. We surveyed 250 tenants in eviction court in Milwaukee because we wanted to know what explains why you are evicted but not you. And what we found was that you can control for 
how much people owe a landlord, household income, all sorts of things that are, that are relevant to that question. And what really matters is, do you live with kids or not? And if you live with kids, your odds of receiving an eviction judgment triple. They triple. And what you're seeing is a landlord saying, I'd rather work with you than you. And um, so I think that, you know, the, the question you asked, there's two pieces to it. And there's obviously a lot more to be, to be said there. Um, I just wanted to pick up actually on her question. And I'm just curious about your influences, if there are any other ethnographic studies that influenced you. And um, it actually, I haven't yet read your book. It made me think a little bit about Adrian Nicole Blog. Very different um, in that it's not, there's no statistical analysis, but she too followed some poor families for obviously many years. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so Adrian Nicole Blanc, of course, wrote uh, Random Family, uh, which is the last book that made me cry. And uh, I feel that, you know, the tradition of people like uh, Kate Boo and Adrian Nicole Blanc, Alex Kotlowitz, people that are writing about poverty from the ground level had a deep uh, mark on me. But I'm also a sociologist, and I see myself very much operating within that tradition. And sociology has a long and established tradition of, of ethnography, especially related to urban poverty. And since we're in Washington, D.C., I've got to plug Elliot LeBeau's amazing 1967 ethnography, Tally's Corner, which is about African-American men in this city, which is this slim, trenchant, very perspective, you know, uh, incredibly uh, observationally brilliant uh, ethnography. That would... That, that's one of my favorites, I'd have to say. So, yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, your presentation and the, the PowerPoint display um, brings out the brutality of evictions and the cost. Um, and uh, when, you, when you walk by a site where there has been an eviction, what you see is not just somebody's belongings, but really their life. And your photograph of the belongings um, sort of raised with me a really very practical question, but none, nonetheless a question. Because what's on the street um, is not just furniture, it's baby pictures, it's um, mementos from family members, you know, et cetera. Right that will never be recovered because by the time the person gets back, they're all destroyed right. or gone. Um, there was a time here in, in the city where, there, where the, the city would pick up belongings and store them. Is that done in, in Milwaukee? Uh, so one thing that, um, that I think that uh, I didn't realize going into it is when you get evicted, often you lose not just your home, but your things, your possessions. In Milwaukee, you're given two options when you get a sheriff eviction, a uh, truck or curb. Uh, curb means that your things get thrown on the sidewalk. Truck means uh, your things get taken by the eviction movers and get stored in bonded storage, um, which means that you, uh, you have to pay basically $375 to get it back if you get it back the first month, and then it goes up every month after that. It's a storage facility. It's a, it's a business. Um, I've spent a lot of time with uh, moving companies in Milwaukee. The biggest moving company is called Eagle Movers. Uh, the, um, the owners of Eagle Movers told me 70% of the moves that they do that are eviction or foreclosure moves just get thrown in the dump. So, yeah, I mean, eviction is, is erasing uh, possessions too. Yeah. Matthew, thank you. I'm, I'm from Milwaukee also, and I uh, really <laughs> appreciate this book. I know a lot of the neighborhoods you're talking about. Um, and I, I work in education, and I just wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about what the impact was on the kids, on their schooling, um, for the kids who were evicted across the different, both in the trailer homes and yeah. in, in the, in the Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this thing is leaving a deep and jagged scar on the next generation. And, um, you know, when uh, Arlene was living in the uh, homeless shelter outside of town, Jory missed uh, uh, 17 consecutive days. Uh, he was absent from school. And, you know, the reason is like, it just wasn't seen as a first, it was a higher, there was a high order needs, right? Let's find a home. And once we do, we'll get you guys in school. And that's how Arlene did it. You know, she'd, when she found a home, she got the kids in school, she invested in school, but then, pff, you know, there was this crisis that would emerge again and again and again. We're not going to be able 
to allow kids like Jory and Jafaris to reach their full potential if we keep batting them around school here and there and everywhere. And if they're going to school hungry because their mom doesn't have enough food to last at the end of the month because so much is spent on housing. We need a lot more research on this. But it's obvious to me that this is fundamental to improving inner city education too. Yeah. Yeah, my name is Betsy. Thank you so much. Incredibly powerful presentation. And I just wanted to ask two quick questions. You chose to speak to us through stories and pictures. And yeah. I'm curious if anyone's approached you or if you've approached others about lifting those stories and pictures up in other venues. I, I'm not sure, but through exhibitions or through, you know, a tour. Yeah. And then the other question, um, you know, you also pivoted. So what are we going to do about it? Yeah. And you said we can do we've got the vouchers. We can do this. Yeah. Um, is is there anyone taking up that mantle? Are there groups coming together? It is a political season. Yeah. These issues are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So those those two fundamental yeah. questions. So uh, to your first question, one thing that I did is um, my wife and I have started this organization called Just Shelter. Uh, you go to it, justshelter.org. Justshelter.org. <laughs> This was not a setup. <laughs> this is, um, we, we did not we did not talk earlier, but I, I always I always look for ways to work it in, and um, and this organization does two things. First, it highlights and emphasizes the role that nonprofits are playing all over the country. A lot of the work going on with affordable housing is block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood. So if you're in D.C. or Bethesda or Nebraska, you can click on this map. You can see the organizations working hard on these issues. You can plug in and get involved. But what we're also doing here, I don't have a slide for this, but what we're also doing is we're allowing people to tell their own eviction stories. So most of the time when my work gets covered in the press, I get letters, often letters actually, uh, from folks that have been like, this is my story. This is what I went through. And I've gotten more and more of those. And I said, we, we have to like broadcast that. So if any of you in this room have experienced eviction or foreclosure and you want to share your story you can go to just shelter and upload it and contribute in your own way to like revealing the human cost of this crisis so that's one thing we're doing with stories to scale up so to speak um so policymakers when confronted with the fact that this country uh has more uh, and worse poverty than any other rich uh democracy usually respond by uh saying jobs jobs and um, Paul Ryan wants to incentivize work. Uh, Hillary Clinton wants to raise wages. That's half, the, that's half the solution. You know, we also need to recognize that poverty is not just a product of low incomes. It's also a product of extractive markets. You know, when incomes rise, the housing market takes its cut. And I think that we need to kind of address this from multiple angles. But... I think without kind of solving and addressing this housing crisis, um, any other poverty solution is gonna is gonna fall flat. So, thank you. Yeah. It was a. <clears throat> I found it to be amazing what you what you laid out. Um, it was it was really fantastic. Just I don't know. It, it just staggers me. <clears throat> but what I wanted to to ask. Uh, uh, you obviously went to a certain level with, with, uh, <coughs> with the people you interviewed and looked at. Um, did you move? Did you think of moving on to the next level of politicians, like uh, members of the council, uh, <coughs> you know, members of the state legislature, um, and and further up? Because I see them as being able to to influence and affect policy. Uh, only if the, this kind of information is really pushed into their is really pushed into their faces. Uh, excuse me, using that expression, but uh, I, I I I really think there are no there are no easy answers to this. I'm I'm sure you're well aware of that. But uh, w w what what forceful methods can be used to make the population aware? Because like in these in these uh, I don't want to carry on. Any, but in, in these elections now, and all the nonsense that is being, uh, you know, talked about, I don't hear the word poverty mentioned very much. And I don't believe between now and the time a, a leader is elected, we are going to hear it. So that's my... So um, uh, one thing I'm doing is uh, writing a book and having conversations like this. I think that that's... 
that's at least a grain of sand in the in the machine. I think that um, I think that I'm a bit more I'm a bit more hopeful. You know, I think that we are having a conversation as a nation today about inequality. Um, that conversation is going on on both sides of the aisle. We see poverty plans from people of various political persuasions. I'm kind of encouraged that we have reached a point as a na nation that we are very unsettled by the level of inequality today. And a lot of us want to do something about it. With housing, there's a lot of reason to be optimistic, too. I mean, just think of several generations ago, we had slums in our largest cities. You know, we had poor folks living without heat and running water. We took on slums and we won that battle. And I am not naive about how much further we need to go on housing problems. When I lived in the trailer park, for the most of the time, I didn't have hot water. And I told my landlord, I'm a writer and I'm going to write about you in your trailer park. So, so imagine what my neighbors had to deal with. But there's no denying that we've made huge leaps forward in housing quality. And now we're just facing this other huge problem, which is the fact that it's getting harder and harder to afford a roof over your head. Now, one of the things you asked is, is there things we can do on a local level? Are there smaller interventions? The answer is absolutely yes. And one very important thing we can do, I think, is to extend legal help to families facing eviction. So unlike criminal court, uh, the indigent have no right to a lawyer in civil court, okay? So in many housing courts around the country, 90% of tenants don't have lawyers and 90% of landlords do. So if you think of someone like Arlene, who doesn't have a high school education, she has to go to housing court and face a lawyer. Would you go? Would, would I go? I don't, I don't know if I'd go. And a lot of folks don't go. So in Milwaukee, 70% of cases that are summoned to eviction court, no one shows up. The sound of eviction court in that city is a name, silence, and then a stamp signaling a default eviction judgment. We can change that on the local level. We can provide families legal assistance and make an investment upstream to stem the tide and the consequences, the cost that we reap for evictions downstream. So that's one powerful uh, thing we can do on the local level. Now, uh, what I did, what I meant to ask perhaps was, uh, when you approach, uh, sorry, uh, when you approached more uh, uh, higher level politicians, such as, let's say, members of the Maryland legislature. Yeah. Uh, how did they, were they responsive? Did they say they've got other more important issues to deal with? Uh, I think that we're, I mean, we didn't know the depth and extent of this problem. I didn't know going into it. I don't think we knew how many people were getting evicted. We didn't know that it was directly causing poverty. So I think that there's, there's still a there's still a lot we have to learn and I think this message about the centrality of housing is still working its way uh, uh, to folks in legislatures yeah thank you very much we'll have time for everyone lined up already at the mic and after that we'll have to wind down um, I too am from Milwaukee and uh, <laughs> this is so cool I this is so cool I I in my youth, I was a tenant organizer, uh -huh. River West, Harambe, yeah. East Side. Yeah. But since then, uh, I live here. I go back every two years in October before the election. Hmm. I've been canvassing, including the neighborhoods you speak of, yeah. both South Side, North Side, yeah. Far West, Northwest Side. Yeah. I, I am struck and stunned by the overall immiseration that I see in that city. Yeah. Uh, a working class city where yeah. 20 years ago you could get a welding job and make eight bucks an hour, which was big money then, or yeah. 10 bucks an hour, 15 bucks an hour. Yeah. Today, that's all over. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, the political consequences yeah. of the housing crisis, I see when I go door to door and try to find voters. There have been tremendous efforts to develop and create support in these communities particularly around the Obama campaigns. When every year I go back, they're gone. They've moved. Nobody knows where they are. The houses are gone. Right. They're boarded up. Uh, this is how you end up with Scott Walker. This is how uh, a state with a progressive tradition has become a right-wing battleground, in part because of that immiseration. And I, I just wondered if you could speak to that 
frankly, the political consequences yeah. of what I really see as the destruction, not just of housing stock, but frankly, the destruction of the community of the people who inhabit it. Yeah. So some neighborhoods in Milwaukee um, have an extremely high eviction rate, you know, and some neighborhoods at the very tail, you know, one out of four uh, renter households in a neighborhood is gone every year. So how do we build a community with that when people are just buzzing in and out of it? And how do we allow people to invest in their community and give it stickiness? And so I think you're absolutely right to articulate the political consequences of housing instability. It's also the fact that, you know, these neighborhoods have been neglected for decades. And there is a lot of suffering there. There's a concentrated amount. And I think that folks that see so clearly um, their own neighbor's pain, which you have to because you're working together to try to make ends meet, those, it's harder to see uh, their potential too, the political potential. You're right about what Milwaukee and other Rust Belt cities have experienced. Between 1979 and 1983, Milwaukee lost more jobs than during the Great Depression. A massive hit. But I also want to say, I just want to say that um, I, I saw that in the lives of the families that this book is about, but I also saw a lot of spunk and brilliance and generosity and um, courage in the face of adversity. So one time uh, when I was with uh, Crystal and Vanetta, we were at the, the Salvation Army homeless shelter and uh, they were homeless and they were eating uh, lunch at this McDonald's uh, downtown. And then um, this boy walks in and he's like, he's maybe nine and his, he had dirty clothes on. It looked like someone made a uh, hit him in the face. He was, he's looked really bad. And uh, he didn't go up to order. Uh, he, he went around to the table looking for scraps. And uh, Vanetta uh, turned to, uh, excuse me, Crystal turned to Vanetta and she said, um, what you got? And these two women, these two homeless women uh, pulled their money uh, went up to that boy, bought him lunch, and Crystal gave him this big old hug and sent him on his way. And when he left, she turned to Vanetta and said, I wish I had me a home. I would take him in. And you see that in the stories of people in the city that we love, too. And it reminds me how gracefully uh, people like Crystal and Vanetta refuse to be reduced to their, their hardships. Um, I think that's terrific, and thank you for bringing this forward. Uh, I just want to, s one final comment. Those people now are going to be required to have a picture ID in order to vote this November. <laughs> this is going to be impossible, and, and we're going to see the consequences uh, because of these kinds of requirements. How, how can you possibly have an authorized governmental ID when literally you don't know where you're going to be living next mm. month? Good point. So I'm not from Milwaukee. Um, <laughs> Next. I, I, <laughs> I, I'd like to point you back to ethnography, um, both as a tool and you personally as an ethnographer, um, because I think it's really interesting as a, a qualitative policy pusher uh, to kind of change the way that people are viewing uh, people and communities. And there was a question earlier about humanizing the tenant owners, the, land, the landlords. I kind of want to ask more about humanizing uh, those that are impoverished or homeless. Uh, I have professors that teach bioethnography that are always worried about poverty pimping. And, the, and there's been a history of the urban ethnographers, white males who have continually gone to the inner cities and kind of you know, done this whole process while, while being very helpful, have somewhat perpetuated and uh, reproduced the norms by fetishizing uh, the communities that they were showing. So I was wondering personally how you as an ethnographer uh, wrestled with lifting up the voices of the poor without and but while uh, continuing to humanize those and and and, and not exaggerate that for uh, for policy changes so i think that an ethnographer has a duty to write about life um in its full complexity as much as it is her his ability to do so so that means writing about um Writing about human suffering, but also human courage. It means writing about um, mistakes people make, but also moments of beautiful generosity. And I think that I took these stories uh, extremely seriously. The responsibility of writing someone's story is, um, for me, one of the um, 
one of the deepest and profound honors of my life. And so I think that um, putting in this book stories like the McDonald's boy, putting in this book times where um, it's like this one time I was with a family, the Hingston family, and they, their housing was tough, man. The landlord was just, just neglecting their place. And uh, it was February, and, um, and they asked me to kind of try to go down in the basement to try if I can see if they, their heat was off, try to see if I can do something with the furnace. And I go down to the basement, and I don't know what I'm doing, right? I was like, I don't know, you know, do the thing, do you kick the furnace or something. <laughs> and then uh, I came back up, and they, they had bought me a birthday cake. You know, they wanted to celebrate my birthday. That's in the book. And I think that, you know, I think writing uh, about people's lives in that way helps us both confront the full trauma and sadness of poverty, but also validate um, and recognize um, uh, the beauty and complexity of, of, of folks uh, down the line as well. I also, this was important to me, have stayed in close contact with folks in the book, and they've read the book long before you guys have. And so I went over every part of the book with them. You know, if I read it to some people, uh, some people read it to me. We had long conversations about it. I think that process was extremely important to me too, not only by forgetting all the facts right, but also making sure I get the essence uh, right. Good evening. I'm a Washingtonian, and I want, first of all, to thank you and congratulate you and encourage you. The element of what you have presented that I see here is you have highlighted eviction as a very, very powerful symbol that touches on and embraces the whole issue of affordable housing. Right. I've close up been working on this for a long time here in Washington. Our church has built uh, about 500 units of affordable housing in downtown Washington where we're located. And I would like to encourage you to try to identify who on the hill or who, who's several to bring the sp use eviction that's a powerful story the way it, it gets to you it's so clear but to have a major hearing on housing affordable housing and it's so dramatic Here, everybody who lives in washington you know that it's just yeah. incredible so that's the main thing i want to say i'd just love to see this i want to see it you know stuck up at harvard yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey i'm out i'm, I'm not, out here i'm out here no yeah right right yeah. I want to encourage you, that's all I'm saying. Thank you. And to, that I will, on my part, with what little contact I have, put the idea out there of whoever I can find to listen. But I just see this as such a powerful tool to tell a story that needs to be high, high profile story. And I will do everything I can if this thing moves forward to rally support and get the thing, there needs to be legislation that addresses it and uh, money from these sources that these individuals have indicated. I encourage you, I bless you, I'm praying for you. Thank you, I, I accept that, thank you so much. I guess I had a, a, a simpler question. I mean, you, you understand that the tenants in these places are, are there partly because they're poor, but I, I guess I wondered, and maybe you explained this before I got here, but. Who becomes a landlord in this? And, you know, how did these people take up, like, 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 did they decide in high school, man, I, I want to, I want to run an apartment or, or own a trailer park? Who, how do, you, how did that happen? How did the, what is their story? You know, where did they come from? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so many landlords are second, third, fourth generation landlords. It's, it comes, uh, in their blood, so to speak. Uh, landlording has traditionally been a way for immigrant communities to get a foothold in, um, in the middle-class America. So in Milwaukee, for example, on the south side, as my Milwaukeeans know, there are these things called Polish flats. So named because Poles came over, jacked up their house, built a basement under and rented it out. And that was one way they kind of uh, earned a bit extra money. So I think that that kind of tradition has been passed down. So a lot of landlords have it 
kind of with them. Sharina, Arlene's landlord, was not a, a second generation landlord, but she she kind of saw herself as an entrepreneur. And I think that landlords uh, share that kind of quality, that idea that they can strike out in nothing, you know, and with their own gumption and, and ingenuity, come back with a living. I think that folks like Sharina and Tobin, my landlord at the trailer park, also have so, have to have this other thing too, which is like a stomach, a stomach for it. You know, it's it's uh, it can be difficult uh, work. Yeah. I showed up a little late, so forgive me if this has been already covered. Um, first, I'm from D.C. and I cover I have covered housing issues in D.C. as a reporter, and one of the th groups that does really great housing work is the Washington Legal Clinic for the Homeless. So if anybody uh, wants to donate money to them, they're the ones that uh, fight in landlord tenant court. Um, they fight uh, DC government and when on on homeless issues. Uh, they fight the homeless shelter where people slept in the slept on the hallways, slept in an abandoned hospital, um, slept next to trash cans, were uh, physically assaulted, were sexually harassed. That's where we live. We live in a very rich place with uh, artisanal ice uh, makers and fancy gentrified 14th Street. We also put our homeless families in an abandoned hospital. So that's where we live, and we should all remember that. Uh, second thing, I just want to ask, uh, there's two big issues that, that affected D.C. Um, greatly in the last, uh, the last decade. I, I want to see if you had addressed You might have already addressed it, but the impact of Section 8 and the impact of Hope 6 and what that did to housing and to housing stability. Because that it does seem like we replaced uh, really terrible public housing with uh, Hope 6. We sold people on that, which was... You know, you know what Hope Six is, uh, and Section Eight really, uh, really was an unstable way of giving people housing. Because you mentioned the vouchers, I just want to get your take on that. So we could have like a fifty-minute chat about like the ins and outs of different housing policy, yeah. and um, I think that, I think that for tonight, what I want to come back to is just scale, scale. Okay, and like in many cities, there's kind of amazing things going on with housing and building cool, affordable housing units, doing uh, ways to incentivize the developers, uh, green public housing. Great. Awesome. Not meeting the need. We just need something to scale. And I think that there's no study that shows that you can offer housing at equal quality for lower cost by building more public housing. Vouchers are the more efficient way to do that. We can make that program more cost efficient. There's things in the book that has have suggestions for that, but I think this is our best way to help the, this unlucky majority. We're like bleeding out. We're bleeding out. And so, like, if it's Section Eight, if it's Hope Six, if it's Light Tech, if it's public housing, whatever it is, we just need something. Uh, but I'm wondering what the lessons learned are so far, since those policies have been in effect. Like the lessons learned are like they work. I mean, Section Eight. I mean, when you when my friends receive a housing voucher, it's like, thank you, Jesus, okay? It's like, I can feed my kids. I can stay in my home. I can live in my community. We know from statistics that housing folks that have housing vouchers live in less segregated neighborhoods than folks that are in public housing. We know that they are able to buy enough food, start more savings. We know that the research on it being a disincentive to work is pretty mixed. There's not a lot of evidence for that. And I think the status quo is a much bigger disincentive to work when you can't like hold on to your house long enough to hold on uh, to your job. And so I think that for me, that's the, that's the bottom line. The issue, really the issue is the waiting lists. Two last very quick questions. Hi, um, I wanted to thank you very much for writing this book. Um, I grew up homeless with my mother in New York mm. City in the 80s and 90s. Um, and we've lived in multiple homeless shelters, but we were evicted quite a bit. Mm. Um, and so it is really healing for me to see your work. Um, and I'm really looking forward to reading the book. Um, I had a question uh, since you were talking about children um, and the trauma, um, which is, I think, a mm -hmm. part of poverty that people very rarely talk about. Mm -hmm. um, I wondered if you um, I had two questions. So one is, um, since the 80s, uh, do you have a sense of uh, how badly the eviction rates have uh, changed throughout the country? Um, have they gotten worse or have they gotten better? And then two, um, do you have a sense uh, as an expert of whether or not um, the trauma of poverty is something that is expanding as a field of study? Mm -hmm. I want to say uh, thank you for sharing that with this room. That doesn't take a little courage. 
And it's a beautiful thing that you can own that and you can uh, give voice to that. So thank you. So um, I think that uh, there are a lot of folks that are doing work uh, on poverty today. There are a lot of folks that I work with in my university that are working on issues of mass incarceration, of de of decriminalization, of uh, labor market discrimination. There are a lot of journalists writing about this today. I think there are a lot of folks that are, um, that are kind of circling the wagon and trying to understand the best way to make a big impact on this, um, on this deep issue. The first question was about trauma and about kind of the, the pain, the shame that, that kind of often comes with that. And I think that's um, something I've experienced. My, uh, my family's home got foreclosed when I was a sophomore in college. Um, I didn't experience that with any sort of, um, you know, political mindset. I just felt embarrassed. You know, I felt shameful. When I uh, showed the manuscript to Arlene, you know, she said, you know, you know, I see a lot of strength in my story, but I also see a lot of mistakes. You know, thing is like when Arlene, when I miss an appointment with a journalist or something, nothing happens in my life. Arlene misses an appointment with a caseworker and she's, she's evicted. And um, so I think that part of this narrative, I hope, is to kind of reframe those things and to show that we all <laughs> make mistakes. The consequences are totally out of whack, though. And um, yeah, and and to uh, and to show that you know this is something that's affecting not tens or hundreds of thousands of people, but millions of folks. And to give us a new way of understanding this that's not within uh, the concept of shame or embarrassment, but within this concept of of um, uh, of this national crisis. Now, have things gotten better or worse? Now, um, there's not a lot of good data on this, actually. We need a lot better numbers on where evictions happening most. Are they going up or down? What cities are doing a good job to stem their eviction tide? I'm working really hard on that exact thing right now. I can tell you that evictions in the cities of I looked at are going up in recent years. And I can tell you that when you read accounts from like the 30s and 40s, eviction looks weird. It looks scandalous. You know, remember that scene in Invisible Man where there's like the old couple that's evicted and everyone gathers around and like move the family back in. And it's like, you know, in the Invisible Man, it's like, what is going on? It's this powerful moment of the book. That's how it used to be. That's how it used to be. It used to draw crowds. There's this like 1930s editorial in the Times that I ran across that, that said something like, it was because three families were getting evicted to the Bronx. And it said something like, because of the cold, only a thousand people showed up to protest. That's what it used to be like here. But now there are moving companies whose full-time job is to evict people. Now, you know, um, there are hundreds and hundreds of data screening companies that collect information and sell it to landlords. There are sheriffs who evict people from day, so like sun up to sundown in our, in our cities. And people have grown very used to the effects lining the curb. So if anyone in here wants to get more data on this, we need you. But I think the problem is, is, is getting worse, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know what your uh, uh, DC housing and affordable housing uh, experience has been, but if it hasn't been extensive, I invite you to a rally tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. <laughs> the Coalition for Nonprofit Housing and Economic Development is meeting at Foundry Methodist Church on 16th Street. The mayor will be there. I'm sure she'd love to meet you. Um, there are going to be thousands of people. I invite you all. This is our opportunity to move this city forward. The, the mayor is committed. Uh, the council is committed. So if you're around 10 o'clock, Foundry Methodist Church, 16th Street. Thank you. You heard it here. You heard it here. Yeah. 16th and feet. Thank you so much. You. And we have books behind the register, and he will be signing right here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.